Since 1853, Steinway and Sons has been synonymous with musical excellence in the building and the design of the Steinway piano. Our founder, Henry Engelhard Steinbeck, had one simple tenet that we subscribe to today. Simply build the best piano possible, period. Today, over 1,500 pianists worldwide proudly bear the title Steinway Artist. What is so remarkable about this distinction is that these are not paid endorsers, but they choose the Steinway piano because of the love of their craft. As president of Steinway & Sons for the Americas, I am often asked what components within a Steinway piano contribute to this unique and imitable Steinway sound. Considering a piano is comprised of over 12,000 parts, it is a little difficult to determine which ones are the most prominent. But I think, as we all know, the soundboard of the piano is perhaps the heart and soul of any piano. And Steinway & Sons, in 1936, had an innovative breakthrough. We developed what is known as the diaphragmatic soundboard that essentially allowed the piano to vibrate more freely, creating a warmer, richer, more resonant sound for a longer, sustained period of time. The action in any piano is an extraordinarily important part of an instrument. And in 1936, Steinway & Sons patented the accelerated action. This was a revolutionary breakthrough which enabled the performer to extract whatever sounds, loud or soft, they wish to get from the instrument. Another exclusive feature of the Steinway piano is the patented hexagrip pin block. The pin block is an integral part of the Steinway piano in that it holds the tuning pins in place using hard rock maple construction angled at 45 degrees in laminations. It is this particular hexagrip design that enables the Steinway piano to withstand any climatic conditions and maintain its tune for extended periods of time. The rim of a Steinway Grand Piano is comprised of hard rock maple, continuously bent in one operation. It is this process that enables the Steinway Piano to endure for generations to come. The scale of each Steinway Piano is the sum of all of its components. And one specific component which is extraordinarily important to every Grand Piano is the cast iron plate or frame. This component is so important to Steinway & Sons that we own and operate our own foundry using bell quality castings to make the Steinway plate. The duplex scale, a Steinway invention, adds color to every Steinway piano by enhancing the termination of each individual note. It takes over a year to handcraft a Steinway Grand Piano from the finest materials available. And it is this painstaking process that enables the Steinway Piano to develop its own unique musical personality. Whether you are an aspiring artist or just want the joy of music in your home, there is a Steinway built especially for you. Boston Piano was designed by Steinway & Sons to meet the needs of those with a desire to own a high-quality piano and to join the Steinway family. By employing the unique patents and expertise that have made the name Steinway synonymous with musical excellence, Boston Pianos achieve a level of quality, tone, and performance that is far superior to any other instrument in its price range. Since its launch in 1992, thousands of Boston pianos have been sold to institutions and individuals around the world. Boston pianos can be found at major music festivals and in music schools, houses of worship, and the homes of those with a love of music. There are a number of key features that truly elevate the Boston piano into a class by itself in its price range. 
The single most important component of any piano is the soundboard because it projects the beautiful tone produced by the instrument to the musician and all who listen. It is the heart and soul of the piano. Each Boston soundboard is crafted of solid Sitka spruce, long proven to be the most resonant material available. Boston soundboards are perfectly tapered, which allows them to vibrate more freely. The result is a powerful, sustained tone. In comparison to other pianos of the same size, the Boston Grand Piano offers a larger soundboard due to its innovative wide tail design. This creates the power, richness, and feel of playing a much larger piano. The action of a Boston piano has the same geometry and many of the same features found in a Steinway piano, including all wood parts, never plastic. The result is proven durability as well as heightened responsiveness and control. By providing the musician with a greater level of responsiveness, tone and playability, the Boston Piano allows advanced players to enjoy a concert level quality of sound and those less advanced to discover and develop their true potential. The case or rim of a Boston Grand Piano clearly shows the design legacy of Steinway & Sons at work. Boston pianos have a hard rock maple inner rim, a feature found in only the finest pianos. With a hard rock maple rim, more sound is redirected back into the soundboard, rather than absorbed as it is by softer woods. One of the many proprietary Steinway & Sons innovations, the patented Octagrip pin block can be found only in Boston pianos. The key benefit to this feature is a smoother pin turn and more consistent pin torque, which allows for a more precise tuning and enables the piano to stay in tune longer. Some other key features of the Boston piano that benefit from Steinway innovations include radial bracing to strengthen the foundation of the piano and enhance tone, pear-shaped hammers to ensure superior stability and more powerful sound, bridges made of vertically laminated hard rock maple for optimum sound transmission, and a duplex scale for harmonic richness of tone and longer sustain. Boston Uprights take advantage of many of the same Steinway design features as Boston Grands, as well as some of the Steinway family features specific to Uprights. Massive staggered back posts provide a solid foundation for the soundboard, ensuring that tone is enhanced rather than drained. Pressure bars provide harmonic richness of tone and a longer sustain. They are Steinway's duplex scale in upright pianos and are present only in the finest uprights. The swinging upper panel opens the case, which opens up the tone, while also providing a large music support surface. A major benefit of buying a piano that is a member of the family of Steinway design pianos is the Steinway Promise. This promise states that if you decide to trade in your Boston piano for a new Steinway & Sons Grand Piano at any time within 10 years, you will receive a trade-in credit equal to the original purchase price. The Boston Piano from Steinway & Sons. The responsive touch will impress you. The rich and colorful tone will delight you. And you will find the price of this beautiful instrument to be surprisingly affordable. We invite you to experience the Boston Piano for yourself. To find the Steinway dealer for your area, visit Steinway.com. The Essex Piano was designed by Steinway & Sons to ensure that beautiful piano styles and finishes are possible in every price range. An Essex Piano is a surprisingly affordable option for those with a desire to own a high-quality piano and to join the Steinway family. 
by employing the unique patents and expertise that have made the name Steinway synonymous with musical excellence, Essex Pianos achieve a level of quality and performance that is far superior to any other instrument in their price range. There are a number of key features that set the Essex apart from other pianos in terms of quality and value. The single most important component of any piano is the soundboard because it projects the beautiful tone produced by the instrument to the musician and all who listen. It is the heart and soul of the piano. Each Essex soundboard is crafted of premium grade, straight grained spruce for proven superior tone quality. Essex soundboards are also perfectly tapered, which allows them to vibrate more freely. The result is a powerful, sustained tone. In comparison to other grand pianos of the same length, the Essex Grand Piano offers a larger soundboard due to its innovative wide tail design. This larger soundboard means a richer sound. The action of an Essex Piano is designed by Steinway and made up of all wood parts, never plastic. The result is proven durability as well as heightened responsiveness and control. By providing the musician with a greater level of responsiveness, tone and playability, the Essex Piano allows advanced players to fully express themselves musically and is a perfect teaching piano, allowing those less advanced to discover and develop their true potential. Steinway designed a grand piano bracing system and upright back assembly to provide a solid, stable platform for the soundboard. Radial bracing on the grands and massive staggered back posts on the uprights creates a solid foundation for the strength and stability of the piano and the beauty of the Essex tone. The pin block of an Essex piano is made of hard maple and layered multi-directionally to grip pins from several directions. This ensures a tight fit and uniform pressure on the tuning pins. Hundreds of cut threads on each pin grip the pin block to keep the piano in tune for longer. Some other key features of the Essex piano that benefit from Steinway designs include a plate made of gray iron that is over-engineered to provide strength to support the enormous string tension. Hammers made with premium grade felt and metal ligatures to deliver optimum performance. Bridges of vertically layered maple for better transmission of sound from the strings to the soundboard and tension and duplex scaling that ensure a longer sustaining tone and added harmonic dimension. A major benefit of buying a piano that is a member of the family of Steinway Design Pianos is the Steinway Promise. This promise states that if you decide to trade in your Essex piano for a new Steinway & Sons Grand Piano at any time, within 10 years, you will receive a trade-in credit equal to the original purchase price. If you've ever dreamed of owning a piano designed by Steinway & Sons, you owe it to yourself to experience the Steinway-designed Essex Piano. The Essex, available in a wide selection of finishes, sizes and styles, delivers a level of playing experience and value previously unattainable, enabling Steinway to meet its goal of offering a range of pianos that satisfies virtually every need, skill level and budget. We invite you to learn more about the family of Steinway Design Pianos and to experience the Essex Piano for yourself. To find the Steinway dealer for your area, visit Steinway.com. Steinway & Sons is pleased to introduce Spiriocast, high-resolution live broadcast from one Spirio to another. Spiriocast broadcasts live to other connected Spirios, or hundreds of Spirios, in real time, delivering an unrivaled audio, video, and musical experience. As a Spiriocast host, you may invite listeners to a private performance or make your broadcast public. Once you go live, video and audio from your iPad will be transmitted to the listener's iPad or any connected device, such as a television. And when you play, the listening Spirios will perform along in real time. Start a live session, schedule a public performance, teach a masterclass, or hold a remote audition. 
and SpirioCast possibilities are endless. Whether you're a listener, teacher, presenter, or an artist, SpirioCast revolutionizes the experience of live, remote performance. Timothy Blair is a senior partner and distinguished professor with Alexander Buono International of New York. As a Steinway artist, he was recently inducted by Steinway and Sons in New York into the Steinway Teacher Hall of Fame. Dr. Blair studied with world renowned pianist Anthony Di Bonaventura, graduate of the Curtis Institute, where he was a student of famed Russian pianist Isabel Fengerova. Madame Pegorova was a student of the legendary Theodore Leszczynski, who in turn studied with Karl Zerny, celebrated student of Ludwig van Beethoven. Dr. Blair, Dean and Professor, All right, well, we've got four minutes. for 30 years in higher education, including 20 years of service as Dean at Westchester University of Pennsylvania, first as Dean of the School of Music, then as a founding dean of the College of Visual and Performing Arts and subsequently as a founding dean of the College of Arts and Humanities. Dr. Blair performs internationally and serves as a visiting clinician and adjudicator, having recently served as the American judge for Steinway SA Pacific's International Youth Piano Competition. Selamat malam para pecinta musik, sahabat House of Piano dan Steinway and Sons Indonesia yang kami kasihi. Pada malam yang istimewa ini, kita kedatangan tamu yang luar biasa dari Amerika Serikat, Dr. Timothy Blair. Beliau akan mengajak kita semua untuk mengarungi seluk-beluk mengajar musik melalui instrumen piano. Kita telah menyaksikan silsilah perjalanan musik beliau tadi, dan rasanya sudah tidak sabar untuk menambah ilmu melalui seri enrichment session kali ini. Sebelum kita mulai, izinkan saya untuk selanjutnya berbicara dalam bahasa Inggris agar komunikasi dengan Dr. Blair dapat lebih nyaman. Good morning, Dr. Blair. Welcome to our enrichment session. On behalf of House of Piano and Steinway and Sons of Indonesia, we would like to thank you very much for your enthusiasm in sharing your knowledge and adventures in piano teaching with us in Indonesia. It is an honor for us to have you as our expert guest, and we sincerely hope that you will have a wonderful time with us today. Well, they would unmute us when it was time. To open our They're session today. Commercial right now, which is interesting. To open our session today, I would like to invite Mr. Diki Salim as the retail manager of House of Piano to say a few words. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Aisa. Okay, hi. Good evening, everyone. And a very warm welcome to all the participants of Stanway Arrangement Session this evening, the technique of memorization. Presented to you by House of Piano and Stanway and Sons Indonesia, support by Boston and Essex Piano. A very special welcome to Dr. Timothy Blair, who is now joining us all the way from the United States of America. And also Mrs. Aisa Suryalso Fletcher as our moderator. Thank you for your support and kindly be a part of our Stanway Enrichment Session. We are very pleased to have so many participants this evening, including piano students, piano teachers, music teachers, parents, music lovers, best greeting from House of Piano. Stanway and Resident Session is one of House of Piano events which has been created and dedicated to enrich the knowledge of the participants. We are very determined to be a part of supporting and developing the skill of pianists and teachers and also the progress of classical music in Indonesia. 
This is why House of Piano is not just providing the best musical instrument, but we also provide an inspiring edu and educational event. We hope that what are you are going to learn so many valuable knowledge tonight, which will be useful to escalate your skill in piano touch and technique. Stay healthy and always keep a positive mind and spirit. Thank you once again, and we hope that you will enjoy tonight's Stanway and its position. Okay, I will pass to Mrs. Aisha for continue this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dickey. Next, we are going to hear a little bit about Steinway Teacher and Educational Partner Program, or what is um, known as STEP Program, a program which is initiated by Steinway and Sons. I would like to invite once again Mr. Diki Salim to introduce the program. Okay, thank you again, Mrs. Aisha. Hi again, everyone. I will explain our new program. Uh, in short presentation with Bahasa Indonesia. Okay, I will uh, share screen uh, the presentation to all of you. Okay. Semua sudah bisa melihat ya. Share screen saya. Oke. Okay. Baik, akan saya jelaskan Bapak-bapak, Ibu-ibu dan Adik-adik sekalian our new program ya, step program. Step sendiri singkatan dari uh, Stanway Teacher and Educational Partner Program, di mana Stanway and Sons adalah sebuah perusahaan yang telah berusia lebih dari 168 tahun dan berdedikasi untuk memproduksi piano terbaik di dunia. Tidak hanya menyediakan instrumen terbaik, tetapi Stanway and Sons juga memberikan perhatian yang sangat besar bagi dunia pendidikan musik. Stanway and Sons dalam hal ini sangat antusias perkembangan dunia musik dan piano, di mana tentunya hal ini dimulai dengan pendidikan. Tahun ini, Stanway and Sons bekerjasama dengan House of Piano memperkenalkan program terbarunya yaitu STEP Program, Stanway Teacher and Educational Partner Program. Dengan menjadi bagian dari keluarga besar Stanway and Sons, maka para guru akan mendapatkan banyak kesempatan, benefit, dan juga value yang hanya bisa diberikan oleh Stanway and Sons. House of Piano yang secara eksklusif menghadirkan Stanway and Sons di Indonesia memiliki dasar pemikiran bahwa sangat penting untuk menggunakan alat musik terbaik untuk menghasilkan kualitas musik yang terbaik juga. Baik dalam proses belajar, mengajar, maupun dalam setiap penampilan pianis. Oke, ini adalah alasannya kita mengapa kita harus join di step program. Ya, salah satunya adalah ya akan mendapatkan prestis ya dan kebanggaan ya karena diasosiasikan dan menjadi bagian dari Stanway and Sons dan juga akan mendapatkan penghargaan dan lebih dipandang oleh publik. Dan juga guru-guru akan belajar tentang Stanway and Sons, dari sejarahnya, desain dari Stanway and Sons family, fitur-fitur pendidikan yang bermanfaat dari Stanway and Sons, bagaimana memilih, merekomendasikan piano yang tepat untuk para siswa dan siswinya, dan juga mendapatkan seminar pendidikan musik mendapatkan Stanway Artist Masterclass dan maupun seminar. Jadi House of Piano sebagai dealer Stanway and Sons di Indonesia memiliki hubungan dekat dan berkolaborasi dengan para pianis ternama dan juga profesional sehingga dapat menyelenggarakan masterclass, seminar, konser dari para Stanway Artist maupun pianis profesional yang secara rutin dirancang khusus untuk guru dan para siswa dan siswi. Juga melakukan Stanway Educational Partner Online Class. Ya, di mana ini diberikan kesempatan ya bagi guru untuk mempromosikan diri. Kalau bapak-bapak dan ibu melihat ini ya memang poster-poster ini adalah online class event yang biasa kita sudah lakukan selama ini ya. Dari Stanway Enrichment Session seperti yang event sekarang maupun Stanway Talk Session seperti poster yang di tengah dan juga yang di sebelah kanan Stanway Concert Series ya. Nah, nantinya setiap nama step teacher akan kita cantumkan di website Stanway and Sons Indonesia yang di sebelah kiri, dan juga website House of Piano yang di sebelah kanan. Dan yang pasti ada juga partner student recitals, di mana kesempatan untuk menggunakan instrumen dan ruang konsep di House of Piano sebagai tempat penyelenggaraan acara yang memiliki standar dan kualitas premium. Serta step teacher 
pasti akan mendapatkan complimentary ticket untuk acara-acara yang diselenggarakan oleh House of Piano. Ya, seperti acara-acara seminar, talk show, masterclass, ataupun standway enrichment session seperti malam ini, ataupun juga kalau lihat poster yang di sebelah kanan, standway concert series, dan juga banyak event yang akan kita lakukan. Nah, ini Bapak-bapak dan Ibu-ibu, salah satu kick-off step ya di Asia Pasifik, khususnya kemarin yang di Shanghai. Event step yang kick-off di Shanghai. Seperti kita lihat, cukup banyak partisipan calon partisipannya. Nah, ini salah satu juga event step di China dan di Malaysia juga. Nah, untuk program dari Step Teacher Step program ini ya, ada dua, yaitu Stanway Educational Partner yang di sebelah kiri dan yang di sebelah kanan Stanway Honorary Professor. Di mana memang untuk Stanway Educational Partner ini mempunyai kriteria ya sebagai berikut, ya memang para kandidat atau calon harus memiliki jurusan pendidikan, baik pertunjukan piano, piano pedagogi ataupun pendidikan piano performance ataupun lainnya juga merupakan lulusan dari akademi musik konservatori atau akademi nesi, akademi seni ataupun juga universitas umum baik di dalam maupun di luar negeri juga memiliki dan menggunakan setidaknya satu unit piano Stanway Ensam atau juga piano Boston atau juga piano SS dalam proses mengajarnya dan juga menyertakan rekaman ya rekaman dua rekaman ya video pertunjukan dan juga video mengajar ya serta juga disertakan surat rekomendasi dari dealer Stanway and Sons di Indonesia yaitu House of Piano juga menyertakan surat rekomendasi dari Profesor Stanway ataupun Stanway artis atau guru Stanway yang bergabung dengan Step ya. sedangkan untuk Stanway Honorary Professor kriterianya adalah memang yang pengajar piano yang berpengaruh juga mempunyai dan menggunakan satu unit Stanway Grand satu unit Stanway Grand piano untuk mengajar hanya untuk undangan dari SAP tidak menerima aplikasi dan juga menjadi pengajar di Doreta Stanway University ini adalah prosedur ya prosedur dari para kandidat step application. Jadi prosedur yang memang harus dijalankan, tetapi tidak usah khawatir Bapak Ibu, dikarenakan memang nanti House of Piano sebagai dealer resmi Stanway and Sons di Indonesia pasti akan membantu untuk semua proses-prosesnya. Oke, okay, thank you. Nanti Bapak dan Ibu akan kita umumkan lebih lanjut untuk event yang lebih detail mengenai step program ini. Ya, ditunggu saja untuk uh, kabar berikutnya. Terima kasih. Uh, Oke, okay, saya balik continue back to Mrs. Aisa. Thank you. Terima kasih Pak Diki atas penjelasan yang sangat informatif mengenai program step. Thank you Mr. Diki for a very informative explanation. Now, without further ado, Let us all welcome Dr. Blair to our virtual hall tonight to present the topic of tonight, the technique of memorization. Dr. Blair, the floor is yours. Good evening. Uh, and good morning from Jacobs Music in Philadelphia. It's a pleasure for me to be with all of you this evening uh, to discuss first memorization tools for your students as well as the second part, which will be basic technique tips for your teaching studios uh, that hopefully you will find to be helpful. It's really critical that young students from age five to 10 or 11 or 12, uh, basically get this information between those ages, as opposed to getting this information at age 13 or 14 because at that point they have to do a rebuild of things they should have gotten earlier. So I've been asked to talk a little bit about memorization. And 
Um, the reality is students practice a piece over and over and over again until they finally learn the piece of music. And then at that point, usually they're told, okay, uh, now go and memorize the music. And at that point, it's really not in chronological order of the way they should have started to memorize, which should begin in the very beginning of learning the piece. And if you will look at uh, your slide, you will see four skill sets, cognitive, visual, tactile, and aural. So I wanna talk about those four things and then we're gonna talk about how they connect to memorization. Um, students begin using their cognitive skills, their visual skills, their tactile skills, and their oral skills at the very beginning of learning the piece. The eyes are feeding information to the brain. The ear is listening for what's going on. Uh, you know, am I paying attention to the dynamics or not? Uh, am I hitting the right notes or not? Uh, and all of this is being sent down to the hands which are learning the note patterns. The point I'm making is in the very beginning, all four of these skills are in alignment. They're all happening at the same time. But as the student progresses and learns the piece, the danger is the mind becomes passive and basically hands over everything to the hand. The ear listens um, happily and the, um, the, the, the visual connection to the mind is basically sending the information, but more and more the student is um, putting everything into the hands. It's all tactile. All right. So at some point, the teacher says, okay, now go and memorize the piece. Well, first of all, uh, students don't know really exactly what that means because there've been no specific directions given along the way. The solution to this is when a student first begins to learn a piece, make sure before they're finished with their practice session, from the very first day that they memorize on day one, the first half a page. Because at that point, their mind is alert, their ears alert, the eyes are alert and the hands are alert. Then as they proceed through learning the piece, next day, see if you can remember the first half or not. And if you can, add the second half of the page. So the point is memorization should begin at the beginning of learning the piece and should move throughout the study of the piece because it's not an add-on. Students often hate to memorize because they can now play the piece and they're enjoying all the notes they're playing. And now they have the drudgery at the end of having to slow down and try to memorize the piece. And here is the great danger. Students convince themselves they've memorized the piece relying unbeknownst to them totally on their hands because the hands have learned, they think, the piece of music. That's probably to some extent true. But then comes the moment of truth. They're about to walk on stage. All of a sudden, the mind becomes super alert and it starts asking questions. Are we really ready? Are we really sure of what we're going to do? Or can we really perform this well? And the last thing that you want is to have a student who's worked very hard to learn their piece, to walk on stage without confidence. 
they have to have confidence because uh, without it, it's a very um, kind of unsettled performance and memory slips most likely will happen. And I certainly have seen this time and again, that now the mind is questioning, which unsettles the student. The student walks on stage, there is no score. So the eyes that are now super alert because of the mind don't know what to do with themselves. So you will see sometimes performances where the pianist is looking around and looking up, up and looking down. That's because they're uncomfortable because the eyes don't know what they're doing. Worst of all, since the mind is now questioning and the, the eyes don't know what to do, the hands become unsure. Remember, the hands are just fine when the student is practicing alone by themselves. There's no nerves, there's no pressure. You walk on stage and you have 100 people looking at you, there's pressure. And if your hands are unreliable, then you will have an uneven performance. So it's really, really crucial <clears throat> that they put these four skill sets to work on memorization as well as learning the piece in the very beginning of learning the piece. Uh, that way, here's what happens. Your mind has something to do when it walks on stage, which is to use the eyes to look at the keyboard, to send information back to the hands to play accurately. So you still have engaged eyes feeding active information to the mind, which creates a focused performance. I like to think of the keys as ballet dancers. And I like to think of the pianist as the choreographer. So when a student is in the process of memorizing the piece as they go along, early on, they're getting used to the eyes looking at the keys, not at the score. And you are working slowly to intervallically help memorize with the hands what's going on. The eyes should be looking for leaps so that they know exactly where the left hand or the right hand is going. Remember, if in the practice room, they're mindlessly practicing with, the, with uh, just the hands, uh, the hands are hitting the right notes with the leaps and so on and so forth. But what happens in a performance is, well, it's maybe it's a different piano and heaven forbid you miss the leap and you hit a wrong note. At that point, if you're completely unraveled, that's what causes memory slips. Um, I certainly have had instruction over the years uh, that was based upon what do you do if you have a memory slip? And that's very well and good. Uh, yes, you should be able to start at different places in the piece. However, that sends a message to the student that you're probably gonna make a memory slip. So you better be ready to have damage control. Well, okay, but wouldn't it be better to have the student not have a memory slip and not have to do damage control? So in reality, if you take this approach to memorization, you know, when a student is learning the piece, uh, they're going slowly because they're learning the notes and they're learning all sorts of things. Well, memorizing then is just one other part of the learning process. It doesn't become an add-on drudgery kind of thing at the end. Um, the next thing I recommend while they're memorizing as they go through learning the piece is uh, to take 
the piece at half tempo once they've learned enough of it. If you take a piece at half tempo, what you're trying to do is to find those connections with those notes where the synapses are not quite wired right. If you're at a higher tempo, somehow the hands will find their way around because that's what they're used to. That doesn't mean that they necessarily know everything that's going on. If you take that tempo down half tempo, then you have to mentally know exactly where the notes are. And, and the student can find the weak points before the weak points find them. And um, that really helps students know what to do with the process of memorization, as opposed to letting it up to them to kind of figure it out on their own and to learn the hard way that, gee, right before I walk out, you shouldn't be asking, am I all set? Am I, am I ready? They should be saying to themselves, I have done absolutely everything I know to do to prepare to successfully perform this piece. It's crucial to remove any self-doubt before going on stage to play from memory. I bring this up in particular because having a memory slip to a youngster between especially, you know, five years of age and 10 can be traumatizing. Uh, if you wanna talk about what may destroy the love of music and the love of piano is to fail in front of your friends, your family from a memory slip. So the idea is to help that child know exactly what they're doing from the very beginning from memory. Another thing I've always done with children's recitals is I've always insisted that every child bring their score. And if I had 12 students performing, I had 12 scores in my lap. And I always sat in the back of the room following along so that if for some reason the child, and it, you know, it can happen, um, gets stuck, rather than leave that child sit there in that horrifying moment of not knowing what they're doing because they don't know where the, where the, they've forgotten their notes. I get up and I put the score in front of them and I point to where to start. And they know in advance that that will happen for me. So they have, going in, they know they also have a security blanket, which removes some of the pressure right from the beginning because they know I'm there, they know I have the score, they know they can finish. So that's a very small but helpful tip just to keep your students happy to perform um, and that memory is not to be feared, it's to be a useful tool. So moving along, I wanna talk a little bit about what I call back to basics. And these are technique teaching tips that are so basic, they tend to somehow not always happen. And these are the kinds of things that need to happen in a systematic way for young students so that their learning experience uh, is sequential, that they're adding new tools in their toolkit as they progress. They're not getting to maybe 13 or 14 and having to have a teacher say, well, you know, now these are the kinds of things we need to address and fix. That means the student has to unlearn certain bad habits. Um, and that is another reason for students dropping out of lessons. To unlearn is really rather painful because you're asking a student who's been playing, you have to stop that. And we have to begin essentially again by removing those bad habits of, 
uh, putting the pedal down and not changing it when the harmonies change. Um, you know, uh, improper positioning at the piano, uh, ignoring rests. And I, I wanna talk about rests in a minute. Um, it's much better to catch these things early on. So for starters, all young students come to lessons, usually they have a thumb that sticks out like this and they have no crown of the knuckles. And you can talk about a, a good hand position as much as you want, but this is an old but good trick. Have them put a ball in their hand. Look at my hand position. I now have a crown on the knuckles. The fingers have a curve. And look at the thumb. The thumb has to be turned in because it has to do that to hold the ball. It's very hard to hold the ball with it out. So I start with that and they get the understanding that, oh, okay, so my hand position should be like this. That's so important because the thumb has to be taught that it is a finger and not an extension of the hand. Some students sort of use their thumb like this to whack the keys, but you know, they're playing from their, their arm. The thumb has to be independent. So after you get the student to understand that the thumb needs to be curved, here are two things to help reinforce that. Have them do exercises with their thumbs and they'll be surprised because they've never used these muscles attached to the thumb before. And you have them maybe make eight circles and stop because usually they'll say, wow, that, that kind of hurts. Well, that's because your muscles are waking up and you've never done it before. But once you do this a little bit, okay, then take it to the next step, which is close the key cover and say to the student, let me see what you do with your thumb. That's when you can tell if they're really using the muscle appropriately as a finger. I'm always surprised when I encounter a student sitting like this. What happens is a student starts at age five and they're very small. So at age five, the distance is okay. But in five years time, they've grown. They have longer legs, they have longer arms, but the eyes are accustomed to sitting that close to the score. So as the teacher, we have to continually make sure that the student moves back. Well, how far back? The answer is that these elbows also can't just be collapsed. Remember, we play the piano from the torso. The arms have to float. So I've, uh, I've used this uh, imagery with a student from time to time. Think of yourself as a puppet and your arm has a string connected to the ceiling and this arm too. Well, you would have floating arms because this is what puppets do. Then they begin to get the idea that, oh, I have to support my arms. They're not like this. So it is a support from the torso. The next thing is students get fixated on their fingers and they concentrate on this and they are so intense on what they're learning that the first thing that gets stiff is the wrist. As soon as the wrist becomes stiff, all kinds of bad things can happen. Students constantly actually hurt themselves because that hurts the tendons. So, you know, an appropriate wrist is one that is as loose as it can possibly be.
the arm plays to the fingers through the wrist. Many pedagogues have gone to, to talking about the wrist. The only problem with that is uh, people become fixated on the wrist. Don't. It just needs to be loose. And that's, that's what happens. Um, before I forget, and I mentioned that I would say something about this earlier, um, rest. This is another bad habit that gets formed along the way. Uh, piano students kind of equate a rest with, oh, I don't have anything to do. I don't have anything to do. So uh, they will pedal through rest so that the sound continues. This seems very basic, but the reality is silence is important because rest indicates silence and silence accentuates sound. So composers use sound and use silence with silence and rest being equally important to the notes. So when I'm working with the student, I'll tell them, okay, I know you think there's not much going on in the left hand. Well, if you'll notice, there's a quarter note and a quarter note rest. Down, up, down, up, 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 down. I make them go through the whole piece, left hand, right hand alone. So that they understand that the note is a down motion, but they have to come up for the rest. And every time they see a rest, they have to get off the keys and forget the pedal as uh, something that keeps the sound going so that the rests aren't heard. Um, on section B uh, on the slides, I have uh, two entries. One is scales and arpeggios, and the other talks about various motions. And I'm going to talk about some tricks about the scales and arpeggios. You'll notice it says thumb under and the arm travels. So students start playing the piano in fixed position. Fine. But when you're playing a scale, you have to get from here to here. The student does this. I must have heard that a thousand times plus. Well, they have to learn that after you play the first note, if you look, here's the hand position. It's not fixed. It's ready to move. So two things that have to happen. One, as soon as the thumb plays, it needs to move to here, behind the second finger, behind the third finger, and now it's in place for when it needs to play. That's what I call thumb under, the moving thumb. And when you play a scale coming down, look what happens. The fingers lead to the thumb, which allows the third finger to fall into place, and you're back again at home base. To really bring this home to a student, I have them play the note with the thumb and pull the thumb against the next note. And the second finger pulls against the next note, which gives them time to think about moving the thumb under. So have them do a little wiggle, pull, 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 pull. You'll notice that a lot of things that I'm talking about are in slow motion. 
That's not by accident. In order for a youngster to really assimilate what's being taught, it has to be done slowly to give them enough time to assimilate what it is they're supposed to be doing. And when you play a scale, the arm travels out and the arm travels back and the arm travels out and the arm travels back. So it's not just about the fingers, it's about the fingers moving with the arm. Um, so I have a little book here that I highly recommend because once, once they have mastered scales and arpeggios, and by the way, they have to keep doing scales and arpeggios because it keeps the equipment, their hands in shape. So every time before they play music, whatever, they have to really be fluent with scales and arpeggios. Um, this little book then takes us to the next step, which is now looking at a score and knowing which motions to use. Uh, you'll notice I have rotary motion, lateral motion, scalar motion, the scalar motion they've already learned from the scales, but they don't necessarily know when they look at the music. The music tells them, this is a scalar motion. This is a lateral motion. So students often learn a piece by using by accident all the wrong motions in all the wrong places till they happen to hit upon the correct motion. But if they really look at the score, the beauty is there's only really four major motions. The scalar motion, the rotary motion. Now, take a look at that. That's not coming from the fingers. That's not how a trill gets played. It doesn't get played. And I have a lot of students, oh, I'll have to make a trill. Oh, oh, it's so hard. No, it really isn't. As long as you begin throwing some weight. So I call it throwing arm weight. And if you look, that's all coming from my arm and the wrist is loose. And so you can make the fastest trills imaginable as long as the mechanism stays uh, free. Um, anyway, there's one other motion that's not up there. It's uh, not a big deal, but it's circular, a circular motion. So, okay, a rotary motion. The reason, this book is called Cherney Selected Piano Studies. It's not the larger Cherney book that goes on for pages and pages and pages. Well, if you're gonna do that much work learning pages and pages and pages of exercises, why not learn a piece of music? What this does is actually reinforce and teach them four different motions. And the lateral motion is actually um, its sister is a circular motion. So, okay. The first exercise, take a look. That's a lateral motion. The student has to learn that if you see five notes up, you play to that note and the arm is going to take you there. Not this. Um, this does that for the right hand. It does it for the left hand. And then exercise three starts with a rotary motion. So you'll notice that the student is being taught this, then a circular motion. You see how important the arms are in terms of having to know what to do? This is 
circular, rotary, lateral, scalar, and I'm sorry, here's lateral. Circular. By involving the arm, you're involving weight. You're involving weight. And I want you to take a look at section C of the next slide. The first point I make is legato and weight transfer and the beauty of tone. I hear a lot of surface we play. And that's because people are playing just at the top of the key. You want to produce a beautiful tone by playing to the bottom of the key bed. That sound is coming from the weight from my shoulders through my arms into the key bed. Um, that produces a beauty of tone that carries across the room. Uh, it's a beautiful tone, which we work for, not surfacy note playing. People say, well, what do I do with staccato? And I have students when they see the little dot, and they think it's like this. No, it's, it's not hard at all. It's just, you tap the note, that's all. Tap, 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 tap. Again, they have to be specifically shown how to do those things. And when I say shown, I also mean that it's important to have interactive lessons. After you've given out some information, ask the student to tell you back what they understood you to say. And then you'll find out if they fully grasp what it was you were talking about. Otherwise, they sit and listen and you talk and you're not quite sure what they're going to do when they go home to practice. Um, the two note slur. Uh, I simply say that it's a downward motion. Notice that the wrist drops only because I've just put weight into the key. And students in an effort to get off of the second note, sometimes in the very beginning, they punch it. They have to be taught that you put the weight into the key and then this finger is on the key and you move through it because you're removing the weight. And that's called the musical sigh. Ha, ah, ah. So as long as they understand they're moving through the second note and removing weight gently, then you have the musical sigh. Phrasing. Uh, we're all teaching students initially to play in time, to count. Uh, you know, we have bar lines for measures. And so students sort of take a vertical approach to music. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. But the composer has in mind a musical sentence, which has an arch and a shape to it. These are musical sentences. They start with an idea, they move, and they end. I use uh, an image like this with a student. When a train leaves a station, it leaves slowly till it manages to get up speed. And in the middle of the trip, you're at the highest speed, you're coming into the next station and you slow up into the station. So again, the principles can be taught with just for young children, just basic five fingers. Here's a phrase. If you play a wind instrument, phrases are natural because you're inhaling 
and you play until you run out of air. That's the phrase. And then you get more air and you go through the next phrase. This being a percussive instrument, you can play all day long and you don't necessarily breathe very much. So I always work with students that um, every time before you play your first notes of your piece of music, inhale. And then the body naturally helps the mind and the hands create a phrase. how you get things to flow the way you want them to flow. Inhale. I sing with my students because they immediately respond to the natural arc of the voice. If you're going to teach a phrase and they hear what it should sound like um, by your voice, at first they will imitate it, but then they will come to understand, oh, this is a natural, this is a natural expression. Okay, moving along to voicing. I wish our hands were on backwards <laughs> because here are the strongest fingers and here are the weakest fingers. But this has to bring out the melody. This brings out the harmony. And then these fingers in between oftentimes have to be lighter. How do you get sound to come out of this little thing, this little finger? Again, the answer is through the arm. This is where the weight comes from. Notice my arm actually makes a circle. Not, that's just coming from my little finger. And even if you have the best little finger in the world, it helps if you support the sound from the arm. So have a student play a chord and have them just remove the other two notes. Notice. Then they understand there's two notes that shouldn't be as loud as the top note, the melody. Then say, okay, now try to voice the top note and play the other two notes not so loudly. That takes quite a bit of practice, but that's how you can get students to understand how to voice. The next item is pedaling. And I'm gonna to add to pedaling chords and how to play chords. Pedaling, I've seen students who have no idea what to do with the pedal. So as soon as they can reach the pedal, uh, and they have the proper distance to the keyboard, which you'll notice is this space and I often encourage students to put the, set, the, the, the left foot on the unicorda pedal because now they're grounded. Everything is in alignment. Let's say you're playing a piece and you really need a different tone palette for soft, not just coming from the keys. Well, you want to add the unicorda.
If this foot is over here, then every time they have to bring it back. So this is the alignment. And when you pedal, students have to understand they're not pedaling in the middle of the foot. They're pedaling at the ends of the foot, the toes. And you, you nurse the pedal, you nudge the pedal. What you don't want is to slap the pedal. A lot of performances, it's very distracting because they're playing very well, but I hear the pedal being whacked and thumped all the time. You don't want to hear them, you just want to hear the pedal. So I have a student learn the function of the pedal by saying, put the pedal down first, play your chord. When you play the next chord, your foot comes up and goes down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. You notice how easy these principles are to be taught if you just keep it simple at the keys. So now you explain that in the piece of music you're working on, every time a harmony changes, and this is why theory is important in your lessons, you have to change the pedal. Otherwise, two harmonies that are different get blurred together. And now that's a problem that has to be fixed. So let's say that hasn't been addressed early. Well, uh, you'll inherit a student with all kinds of blurred pedal sounds. You have to say to them, well, no, you have to change the pedal when the harmony changes. They should have learned that early on. Um, Playing chords. A lot of students want to play a chord. The wrist is stiff. This is stiff. And they're punching things. Show them that chords come from here again. Once they understand this, they'll understand a rich, full tone because it's coming from the weight, from the torso, through the arms, through the keys. We're going to just talk a little bit about a, lecture, uh, uh, a lesson format, uh, section D, the slide. And uh, there's different schools of thought about lesson time. For younger kids, 30 minutes is about what they can absorb. And I like the Russian school approach, which is two 30 minute lessons a week, because that really helps the student from not drifting. And it helps keep maintaining their focus. So they have a 30 minute lesson, they have a couple days to work on what they were assigned, then they have another 30 minute lesson uh, to reinforce what they've been practicing. Of course, if you have an older student, we all like the hour lesson or so. Um, but the interme intermediate lesson the, for the intermediate students, I love the 45 minute lesson because it allows for the natural growth musically from the 30 minute time span to 45 minutes. Um, you have to have a very structured lesson because you only have so much time and it's up to you to keep everything moving along. So you'll notice, I usually have the student warm up with 10 to 15 minutes of showing scales and technical exercises. And I tell them specifically which scales uh, and which technical exercises I'd like to hear from week to week. So they come in and they know they're gonna play four scales for me. Uh, we go through major, we go through minor uh, and, uh, and maybe 
four of these technical exercises. Then there's always some basic theory. Uh, for the young kids, there's what is known the, as the uh, theory papers by Lila Fletcher. You can find it online, Google Lila Fletcher theory papers. What's nice about that is it helps teach a young kid theory in a way that's not overwhelming. For each week, they get sent home with one page and one page only. And you talk about what's going on on that one page before you send them home. And then they go through and they do it. They can, be, they can have that page done in their first practice session. And it becomes a building process. Okay, um, you gotta teach sight reading because a lot of students that's uh, something that's uh, not very well developed and it needs to be taught. For one thing, you have to have students understand peripheral vision, that when you're playing notes, I'm looking at the notes, but out of the bottom of my eye, I can see my hand. I know where my hands are. We don't want students to get, this is a very bad habit where they're looking at the score and they're looking up and down and they're looking where their hands are to go. Um, they can't play like that. Uh, it, it, um, that is a bad habit that has to be stopped early on. Make it a game. Say to them, can you see your hands with, while you're looking at the music? They can. Maybe just do one hand until they convince themselves, hey, I, I can move around and feel my way and I have enough peripheral vision that I can see what needs to be seen. Um, Okay, that leaves then generally 15 to 30 minutes for the repertoire. I highly recommend in order to keep the student happy that you have an older piece and a new piece so that they feel pretty good about the older piece because it's getting better and better, but it doesn't get totally stale because you're introducing new music new music, um, you know, you never want a student to spend months on one piece because they need to learn more than one piece in months. And that sometimes happens. I'm gonna move along now to section E in practicing. If you send a student home after having had the lesson and you say to them, now go home and practice. What does that mean? The student assumes that maybe that means that you go home and play the same piece over and over and over and over and over and over until it's magically somehow seems to get better. Except for those places where the next day you still can't play that passage and you play it over and over and over and magically after the sixth time, it comes out right. Okay, I, I think I have that learned. That's when the teacher at the lesson has to be very specific about the piece of music. And you have to talk to the student about the score and say, here, which of those motions that we've learned will you use? And the teacher in the beginning also has to help the student, of course, by indicating correct fingering with pencil in the score, key fingerings so that they don't use three or four different finger patterns, um, but they don't know which is the correct one. That's a bad habit. Eventually then you want to work the student through fingering so that um, they can begin to take responsibility to do their own fingering. And then you can double check and say, well, I don't agree with this one, but those two are fine. Every one of my students has a notebook and the notebook is for two things. The notebook is for them to remember what was taught at the lesson so that they can stay focused specifically on what they are to do till they see me the next time. And when they come the next time and they bring the notebook, it helps me stay on track with them. Because if you have 12 or 20 students, uh, you don't want to take any time to think, now let's see, uh, we're working on what? Uh, no, that makes it easier for both of you. 
So as you'll see number three, I say give very specific and clear directions. You'll notice I've been pointing that out kind of repeatedly today, but I think that uh, that's what's crucial that students get those directions and then practice slowly. The magic word is slowly. I know they're all trying to work their way up to speed, up to tempo, but not at the expense of leaving some of the notes behind, some of the rest behind, not voicing, not paying attention to dynamics. Phrasing. So if they practice slowly, you're saying to them, you, you have to show me that you've assimilated all these things we've been talking about. You'll also notice that I talk a lot about have them do things hands alone, hands alone. You never want one hand to be inconvenienced because the other hand doesn't know what it's doing and vice versa. So I need to see that both hands have learned what they need to do. And then of course, you have to tell the students something about the historic context of the piece. You know, Baroque architecture and Baroque music, so different than classical architecture and classical music, which is so different than the Romantic period, which is very different than French Impressionism. And then we have new music. They need to sort of understand a little bit about the life and times of when Bach lived, they need to know something about the background of Mozart and where he lived and what he did, because they have to understand that the music came from people. It came from people. And they lived at certain times that are very different than ours. So I'm going to now just move to a few things that uh, I think are basic that we always have to remember. We don't teach piano. We teach people how to play the piano. Teaching is more than disseminating information. Teaching is more than correcting errors. Teaching can't be negative. Um, so always remain engaged with who is your student. Every student learns differently. Uh, every student, you have to reach and diagnose what makes them tick. And I really encourage the interactive learning because that helps make them feel as if they have an active role to play in what they're trying to do. When I was 16, I was gifted my Steinway Grand Piano, Model M. And it made all the difference in the world. I had had uh, a spinet that was very old and the action wasn't good. And I would go then to have my lesson with my teacher who had a Steinway Grand. It was very hard for me to do on the Steinway Grand. What I could do on the spinet because the spinet would only let me play the note. I couldn't really bring out the tone correctly. And as soon as I received my Steinway piano, it could do for me what I was responsible for doing for the music. You'll notice Steinway and Sons of Course stands for excellence. Well, as teachers, we want all of our students to achieve excellence and to aspire for excellence. So they need an instrument that is able to do for them what it is they need to do. If you're in sports and you're playing baseball, you want the best bat and the best glove. If you play tennis, you want the best tennis racket. Well, the same goes for the piano. Learning is lifelong. Continuing education is lifelong. And teachers should always continue to aspire for excellence. We can never learn too much in this life. It's vital 
to continue to be engaged with finding new ways, validating some of the ways that you're using and everything in between. That means you have to stay up to date with developments uh, in education, psychology, technology, through seminars and continuing education, just like this STEP program provides for you. You wanna have a growth mindset and you wanna be a role model for your student who will be watching you very carefully because as they grow and learn, you are a critical part of their life. And can you ask anything better than to be a teacher and to take a student who cannot do something one day and help them do it the next day? Thank you very much. Wow, amazing, Dr. Blair. That is very captivating and very inspiring event we have tonight. Please give Dr. Blair a round of applause. My goodness, you really have um, summoned up uh, how many years <laughs> in 45 minutes or one hour. Amazing. Uh, it was, uh, it's basically 40 years in 40 minutes. Uh, <laughs> And, and I have to tell you, I'm doing this at eight in the morning. It gets even better at 10 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but for us, it becomes um, a little late because we are approaching midnight, not so late. <laughs> but we're um, willing to stay up a little bit longer to listen to whatever you have to say next. All right, before we are venturing to question and answer sessions, Please allow me to share information a little bit about Steinway and Sons Indonesia, the Steinway Youth Piano Competition 2022. Let us begin with snippets of Indonesian Steinway Youth Piano Competition's journey throughout the year. Mas Rizky. Enjoy the process of learning. Tidak terasa bahwa Steinway Youth Piano Competition 2022 akan segera diselenggarakan kembali. Sebuah kompetisi piano yang sangat penting di Indonesia dan juga tentunya di dunia. Saya ingin berpesan, persiapkan diri kalian sebaik mungkin. Enjoy the process of learning. Latih kedisiplinan dan lebih membuka wawasan terhadap musik. And I wish you good luck for your very best preparations and performance for the competition. Mempersiapkan kompetisi piano melibatkan bukan hanya dari segi aspek teknik saja, tetapi juga dari aspek musikalitas, mentalitas, dan psikologis yang sehat dan motivasi yang benar juga kenapa kita mau mengikuti kompetisi piano. Penilaian bukan hanya dilihat dari segi tekniknya saja, tetapi yang lebih penting adalah message di balik not-not itu semua. Sehingga kita membuat decision akan not-not tersebut, sehingga performance kita nantinya akan menjadi sesuatu yang personal, sesuatu yang unik, dan sesuatu yang sangat ekspresif sekali, tanpa merusak original intention dari si komposer. Sebagai pianis, kita pun perlu berlatih tiap hari. Namun jika kita tidak pernah terjun dalam suatu pertandingan atau kompetisi, 
kita tidak akan pernah punya kesempatan untuk menguji coba kemampuan kita, permainan kita. Kita juga tidak bisa belajar dari permainan orang lain dan kita juga tidak pernah punya kesempatan untuk mengukur apa ukuran kita, kekuatan kita sampai hari ini. Kesempatan terjun dalam suatu kompetisi memberi kita suatu audience, suatu uh, pengalaman bermain di piano yang berbeda, bermain di piano yang terbaik di dunia, yang mana akan sangat mem- memberi kita suatu valuable lessons, di mana kita akan bisa terus lebih menggali kebolehan kita. Untuk itu, saya nantikan penampilan kalian di Steinway Youth Piano Competition 2022. Adik-adik, kalian telah mendengarkan semua komentar, pengalaman, dan juga uh, nasihat-nasihat dari para juri Signway Competition sebelumnya. Oleh karena itu, marilah kita berpartisipasi dalam kompetisi ini. Tidak hanya bagi kepentingan dan kemajuan kita sendiri, tapi juga bagi kemajuan permusikan di tanah air. So that was the journey of Indonesian Steinway Youth Piano Competition from 2012 until 2020. After a very intense period of the COVID-19, we are very fortunate to be able to organize the Steinway and Sons Indonesia Steinway Youth Piano Competition 2022. It will be held on May 13th to 15th, 2022. That will be the semifinals online. May 18th, that will be the announcement of the finalists. And June 11th and 12th, 2022, will be the final round in Jakarta. We are planning to do this on site, offline, but please wait for further notice from us. The winner will be representing Indonesia to bigger events, Steinway Asia Pacific Regional Final on July 2022, International Steinway Festival, September 2022, Steinway Winners Concert on December 2022. All of these above are to be confirmed. There are two categories for this competition, Talentum and Novus Talentum. In Talentum, we have four different categories. Talentum A is for those who are younger than 10 years old, born after June 13, 2012. Talentum B is for those who are younger than 13 years old, born after June 13, 2009. Talentum C is for those who are 13 to 17 years old, born between June 13, 2005 until June 13, 2009. And Talentum D is for those who are younger than 25 years old. born after June 13th, 1997. We also have the Novus Talentum. We have three categories, Russian composer, for those who are born after June 13th, 2012. Early dances, for those who are born after June 13th, 2010. And Sonatina, born after June 13th, 2010. Registration for this competition will be held from February 15th to April 15th, 2022. So you have two months to register. For more detailed information, you can open the website www.houseofpiano.com to see all the requirements and download the application form. If you need further information, please contact the competition committee by phone 6221-5698-5519 or 5520 or by fax 
6226-2336 by mobile phone, 6221-878-0021-8800. Or you can contact them also by email, isypc at houseofpiano.com. You can also see the complete information in the chat room will be provided by the House of Piano. So there are many ways to contact the committee. We cannot wait for your participation in this special event from Steinway and Sons Indonesia. Maybe uh, Dr. Blair, would you like to say a few words about the benefit of entering a competition? Absolutely. Uh, as pianists, we're rather solitary people. We spend a lot of time alone with our piano. I always encourage students to participate in recitals so that they get a better sense of how they fit into the larger picture. And competitions simply take that to a higher level because it's important for a student to be able, first of all, to play the best that they can play. That's the primary. But then by comparing how they play to others, it helps give them a better sense of where they are in their musical growth. So I really find that competitions are a valuable teaching tool in, in, a, in and of themselves. Um, and I, I highly recommend them. Um, and as you know, I was the American judge for the recent uh, Steinway competition. And it was uh, wonderful for me to hear so much talent and so much dedication out there on behalf of so many students. So uh, I, I strongly recommend it. Thank you so much, Dr. Blair. Okay, now let us move to the most awaited part tonight or morning is <laughs> the question and answer time. Okay, let's see. All right. Are you ready, Dr. Blair? I'm ready. Let's see if we can uh, stump the teacher. Here. <laughs> okay, the first question is from Josefina Villanueva. How early should I memorize a piece? Should I memorize after completing the piece or earlier? You should start memorizing from the very beginning of learning the piece. Uh, and when I say that, remember, you're still using the score as you learn the piece, because I'm not advocating that you memorize so quickly that you may be missing notes and all kinds of details in the score. But by having all four tactile and, and cognitive and oral uh, and all of those skills, visual, uh, working together on both learning the piece and memorizing the piece, during the learning stages, that's much better uh, to have better memory than uh, tacking it on at the very end of the process. Very true. So baby steps, you know, Dr. Blair, little by little from the beginning. Baby steps, you know, uh, once upon a time, I had a professor on uh, my doctoral committee walk into the class and he gave all of us uh, two phrases at our desk and said, you have 10 minutes to look at these two phrases and then each of you are gonna come up and show us what you can do from memory. And I had never had that happen before. And I don't think many of us had, but we all did pretty well. And it surprised us that what you could learn from here using the eyes to the notes very early and very quickly. It's going back to your material about cognitive um, memorization. Yes. Okay, now we have a second question, Dr. Blair, raise yourself. <clears throat> we have many questions tonight. Um, it's from Stefiani Januar. I have encountered some students who cannot memorize. We tried with the usual practice, then singing, then with visual omission too, but they said they just can't. What are the ways would be helpful to help them memorize? 
Well, you know, initially, students often think they can't memorize because they don't realize that it is a separate skill from actually playing the piano. And they need to be taught to use their eyes to look at their hands. And you know, you use the word baby steps. Well, if you say to a student, without looking at the score, can you play the first phrase? How much can you play? And then stop and say, okay, don't concentrate on what you can't do right now. Concentrate on what you just did right. And then take another small step and just do it right. And then tell them they have to reinforce that by then doing that repeatedly so they feel comfortable with it. What I think most students uh, are confused about, they think memorization should be fast. Mm. Yes. Well, it's not, it's, it's not fast. Uh, and it, by contrast, it's actually slow. And so they get frustrated because they try to play maybe the whole piece and they can't. And then they say, I can't memorize. They have to be encouraged to, to succeed at what are baby steps so that they build confidence that yes, you can memorize. Look what you just did. That's that when I encounter a student who says that, that's exactly the way I go about it. Um, I don't find singing to be helpful at that stage because it's really a, a mental thing about understanding that you're looking at a keyboard now, not the score, not all the notes, and you're now having to tell your hands what to do from here. So make sure they're not discouraged. They can do more than they think. Baby steps, positive encouragement. Positive wow. Positive encouragement um, and no pressure. Pressure really makes people not be able to do what they need to do. So baby steps with encouragement tends to work. Amazing, Dr. Blair. You make it seem so easy. Okay. Well, it's, you know what? I want to say something about that. Mm -hmm. It's an old expression. The devil is in the details. <laughs> and so sometimes we overly think things and make things highly complex and we forget to focus on the smallest things. And the smallest things <laughs> build into larger things. So. Perfect. So I think uh, this, this lead into the next question um, is by Rinaldo Linville. Good evening, Dr. Timothy. I am intrigued by the statement you have addressed that some students were traumatized, either it was a piece or by teacher's statement, which makes them fail to memorize the piece or decided to quit the instrument. I knew it was tough to regain their trust in music since there's an adage that said, broken glass is cannot be repaired in a perfect way since it was already shattered. But sometimes there is a way to make the glasses whole again. In general, how can we boost their confidence again to learn and memorize music and heal their wounds at the same time? Thank you. Musicians or those who want to make music, we always have to remember there is underlying a frail quality because they are so sensitive, which is why I believe totally in encouragement from the parents, encouragement from the teacher, so that, okay, you make them feel they can do it. And they are relying and looking at you as the teacher to tell them it was better this week. You can do it. You are doing it. Um, we have a, a, an interesting balancing act between 
demanding as we should uh, the correct learning of everything. Crescendos, decrescendos, forte, piano, phrases, everything I touched upon today. But we must never lose the student along the way by giving them concrete information to build them as musicians. So when I'm sharing things with students, I want them to feel that I have the respect for them. Yes. That I need them to be able to say back to me what they're thinking. Because otherwise, I'm just a talking head pouring information into the receiver. And the receiver, I may have lost that student 10 minutes into my lesson without knowing it, unless the student starts to talk a little bit back to me. So I use a lot of questions in my lessons, not just giving out information, but so what did you think about that? Do you, do you, uh, do you need me to show you again? I, I ask them to be engaged. That makes them feel uh, special. It makes them feel valued. Uh, and it also does what we want, which is to stimulate their minds to be remaining active and growing. So it goes back to what you said earlier as well. We teach the person first and respect them. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, and I, I uh, the reason this is uh, so um, important to me is I didn't mention, but when I was 13 years of age, I got my second teacher from the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. And I went through a whole year that was pretty painful because all the bad habits I talked about today, I had all of them and they hadn't been corrected. So for a whole year, I couldn't play music publicly. I had to do away with all my old music and we literally started from the beginning. Not every student is serious enough or tenacious enough to want to spend a whole year doing that. That's why I'm so passionate about teaching these basics from ages five to 10 or 12, so that when they get to 13, they can keep moving. Um, and the other thing is in my, uh, my uh, career at one point, um, and this was for the, the doctoral program, the unthinkable happened. I was told, here's, here's all new music you've never seen before. It's 90 minutes worth of music. You have 90 days to learn it, and you have 90 days to memorize all of it. And now you're going to perform it in front of a full public audience and the judges. Well, I immediately thought I'm going to have to spend six or eight hours every day, which I broke up into chunks so that I didn't go, you know, paralyzed in my mind. Uh, but I realized on day one, I don't have the luxury of playing the piece over and over and over and over and over again, and then trying to memorize it. I knew I didn't have the time. So I taught myself to learn the piece from memory incrementally as I learned the piece uh, and it worked. So that's how I know it works because I actually did it. And that was with a lot of pressure. What I'm advocating is <clears throat> make memory just a natural part of the learning process first. Wow, yes. Um, <laughs> I can totally relate with that pressure. Thank you, Dr. Blair. One more uh, question for you. So for those who have not been answered the question, Dr. Blair will answer directly after this, after the, after the event is finished. Dr. Blair is going to write a mail answering all your letters, uh, questions, sorry. And House of Piano will give them to you directly through emails or WhatsApp, yeah. So for uh, Jacobus, Patrick, uh, Uniasri, Christiana, um, 
Aomer Marlsen. We will uh, try to contact you later on with the answer from Dr. Blair. We have a lot of questions. So the last, last, uh, the last question tonight, Dr. Blair, is um, how can you make a child love music from the first lesson? I would remove the word make. We don't want to make a child love music. From the beginning, we want to help the student to love music. Um, one thing that I do to make it fun is I play little duets with my student because now they're playing along with their teacher and they love that because it's interactive uh, and it's very different than them alone playing with me sitting or, over on the side. So uh, just a quick concrete thing I would do is learn little duets with your student. Um, you know, you can substitute that in a lesson for the sight reading part that day. Um, the other thing is, it's difficult now because of COVID, but I always encourage my students to go to piano recitals, just to hear other people play. Uh, and also certainly recordings, but I think it's better if they can, when they can, to do it in person because it is after all a personal art form. So those are two, two suggestions. Uh, another thing that comes to mind is in the beginning, most students are playing basically the notes of um, early Clemente, uh, early Mozart. So it's very noty. When they're able to reach the pedal, that is a real tonic for their morale because now they can make all this sound, which gives them an enormous boost. Um, there's a book you can get online of music called uh, Preludes of Romantic Style by William Gillock, G-I-L-O-C-K. And what he was able to do was take very few notes, but very carefully make them into chords with the pedal that allow a student who is very early in their years to make uh, larger sounds. And those larger sounds, that's also a tonic for them. Wow, that is um, great information, Dr. Blair. Well, and you know, I say that because I, I'm, I was always trying to sense where the student was when they would come to a lesson, because I could tell from the body language, whether they were enthusiastic or, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm here again. <laughs> and so I always knew I had to find something to change up the act to keep them engaged. And as soon as I could add a little bit of pedal with anything, that helped. Um, and again, little duets, they love them. That's true. They always love to play with other people, especially their teacher. <laughs> well, and you know, uh, when I was very young, one of the things that my teacher did was pair the students with each other. So I played duets with another student who was in the same studio that was that was fun too yeah so you can even make up your own accompaniment right <laughs> okay friends uh we'll come to conclusion of tonight's webinar so to speak this is incredible webinar dr blair so as i go through um i learned that every person is an individual learner. We teach people first, music following. And the second thing that we have to always look for is basic skill. Basic skill is very important from proper position, sitting position, hand position, awareness of arm movements and relax relaxation. Scales, the foundation of mastering all music. Sight reading. And of course, the knowledge about stylistic differences for classical, romantic, modern, and new music. 
the third thing that we have to always have in our heart is to show them how to practice at home. Because otherwise, they will not improve the next time. <laughs> so lastly, as a teacher, we are a lifelong learners. We have to always develop oneself for the benefit of our students. Stay up to date through seminars, webinars, reading, performing, and always, Dr. Blair told me this last time, always get up to date with technology <laughs> because it is um, right now is the source of all knowledge, right, Dr. Blair? We would like to thank Dr. Timothy Blair for an amazing musical adventure that all of us experienced tonight. We also would like to thank House of Piano and Steinway and Sons Indonesia as the initiator of tonight's event. Last but not least, please allow us to extend our highest appreciation to Mr. Robert Rinaldi as the president of Jacobs Music, as well as Mr. Kevin Heinzelman and Brittany Slaymaker as the technology expert for being outstanding partners without whom tonight's event would not be possible. Thank you, Jacob Music Team. Thank you so much, Dr. Blair. We will miss you. Para pecinta musik, sahabat House of Piano dan Steinway and Sons Indonesia yang kami kasihi, terima kasih atas kehadirannya pada malam hari ini. Semoga apa yang kita lalui bersama dapat bermanfaat bagi kita semua. Sampai jumpa pada acara-acara House of Piano dan Steinway and Sons Indonesia berikutnya. Salam sehat selalu. Selamat malam. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.